good evening friends uh welcome to uh, today's webinar uh, as you all know uh, today's topic is imagining india for contemporary uh, politics and uh, what the what should the left do in these times this is the theme we have chosen for this evening and uh, uh, we are all witnessing uh, how a a particular distorted version of indian history is be, being used as a political weapon by uh, bjp and sangh parivar forces to whip up a majoritarian and authoritarian passions and uh, retain their power and also uh, dismantle whatever democratic um, institutions and uh, constitutional democracy we have in this country uh, this poses in two challenges uh, one how to effectively uh, address this question or defeat these forces politically and at the same time it also uh, poses a challenge that how we the left and the progressive uh, camp in general how do they imagine india because they have a one set of imagination one particular version of imagination regarding india uh, we know what kind of imagination it is they are very clear about it but in the progressive camp in the left and in the social movement and other people there is no one uh, common idea of uh, india and there are almost different voices as far as india is concerned ranging from whatever indian past is completely bad to so there is no point in going back to indian past and uh, we have to create something new uh, ranging from that kind of a standpoint uh, to uh, uh, past or cultural issues are no more important Uh, for politics that kind of a uh, standpoint so it is high time that we take up this issue and uh, present our own imagination of india which is consistent with modern values and also uh, constitutional democracy for the present moment and also which is consistent with the future transformation of this society so we keeping this in view we have uh ask the uh dr ravi sinha to give this talk and uh, after this talk he will make his presentation in one hour 20 minutes or so and then after that we will have discussion so i uh, appeal to you to uh, have your questions at the end of the presentation after he once he finishes his presentation you please shoot your questions after that so i invite uh, uh, ravi to uh, make his presentation okay thank you bhargo and uh, thank all of you i see some of my very old friends you know after many many years on the screen uh, <clears throat> uh, welcome to you all uh, thank you for joining in um as bhargo said uh this afternoon i plan to talk about uh what you might say uh, the idea of india and how um it feeds into contemporary politics um i will not <coughs> um be giving uh my own version of who we are you know in the style of some of you might know the nationalist hindi poet mathili sharan gupt who said hum kaun the kya ho gaye hain aur kya honge abhi aao vichare aaj milkar ye samasyaen sabhi who we were what we have become and what we will what we have become and what we will become let us uh, <coughs> think about you know uh, such issues not exactly in that style i will go i will try to keep 
as close to politics as possible. Although uh, I will touch upon some theory, some history, but I will always try to keep politics interesting. Of course, you know the background, Bhargo gave you the background too. Uh, the background is the, the disaster that India has inflicted upon itself, first in 2014 and then again in 2019. And even more disturbing or tragic seems to be that despite all the suffering, you know, that whole of India is going through, especially the poor, especially lower half of India, you have seen the plight of migrant laborers um, and the daily wage earners in this lockdown and in, in this economic shutdown, how they are making ends meet, what they are eating, you know, who knows. And despite all this suffering, we cannot be sure that if today elections were to happen, the same people who, who are suffering so much will not again inflict similar disaster upon themselves. And that's the tragedy. That will be in a way uh, central concern um, that I will share with you and its causes I will share with you this afternoon. If you're wondering that how come, you know, <clears throat> progressive and leftists, you know, are, are why should they talk about the idea of India? Because often it is thought that such phrases probably belong to nationalist, ultra-nationalists, you know, semi-fascists, fascists, and so on. I should clarify that that's a, that's a misconception. Um, idea of India everyone uses. And the phrase itself, many of you might know, that is Tagore's phrase. Tagore coined this phrase, idea of India, in 1924. And you know, Ravina Tagore was an internationalist. Ravina Tagore was someone who wrote the anthems of two different nations, you know, Janagalaman, you know, in India, Amar Shonar Bangla, in Bangladesh, of course, he did not write it as national anthem. He did not know that they will become national anthem of, uh, of, of the nations that will emerge out of um, the British uh, colonial rule. But you know Tagore, you can say in one word, the internationalist, the poet who, who had whole humanity at the center mm -hmm. Of, of, of his thought and, 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 and his literature. So don't, do not, please do not be, become worried about our using of this phrase of idea of India. And I will use, even though nationalism will come uh, in discussion at times, uh, but I will use it mostly uh, in the civilizational sense, or you can say in the sense of the subcontinent, because we are, we are trying to figure out why and how does one's idea or people's idea of distant past, even ancient past, uh, becomes uh, harnessed in, roped into the contemporary politics. So let me start with um, Hindutva's India. You know, I don't have to say a whole lot about that, especially to this audience. We all know uh, it, it very well. But just for completeness sake, um, Hindutva's idea of India, you can describe it as a special kind of mythical India. You know, you know Ram is, a, is at the center. You, we have witnessed in our own lifetimes uh, the whole probably the largest political mobilization in the post-independent India in the name of Ram and in the name of temple in the, and, and, and dismantling the <clears throat> Babri Masjid and so on. They have kept the mythological figure of Ram, the religious figure of Ram as a god, as Mariada Purushottam, at the center 
of their idea of India. Other religious icons also come in. Um, they, they are inclusive, very inclusive as far as gods are concerned, as far as Hindu gods are concerned. But at the center of this mythical India is their concept of cultural nationalism. And this cultural na nationalism, you know, you, you, you can easily count the, some of the characteristic features of, of it, you know. Firstly, it is majoritarian. Secondly, it is majoritarian based on religion and related, of course, just for counting, just for clarifying that it is exclusivist. You know. It is majoritarian and exclusivist based on religious identity. And it has the way it, you know, it's very easy for this kind of mythical conception of India to erase large part of history of India from its consideration. For example, it more or less erases, it erases much of history, most of India's history um, and confines it, it to mythology. But specifically it erases the medieval period, medieval period, which in other words, you can also say the Muslim period or the Islamic period, you know, the Muslim rule in India from um, 12th century to formally speaking 19th century when 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 uh, um, <clears throat> formally Mughal empire ends but you know at least till 18th century when British take over the subcontinent now that's the that's the key ideological point that is you know they put it also they uh, but their institutional structure the other feature of in, in, in the part of their political theological framework. The institutional structure, you know, and now BJP, you know, power then also has, uh, has, has, has a, as a, what should I say, daughter body, son body of RSS, you know, um, uh, the, it, it, it plays a major role now being in power. Uh, so RSS and not only RSS, RSS is only about 100 years old, even, even precursors of RSS, you know, there were Hindu Mahasabhas and, and, and Hindu mobilizations, you know, they have a history of 150 years, you know, and even before RSS came into existence, all these organizations were there and they were very widespread and, and even in Congress party, we will, we will, we will come to Congress party more later, but even in Congress party, uh, sadly, uh, uh, always has had um, uh, people, uh, tendencies, uh, strands, uh, which could easily fit into the RSS framework. Don't go by, I mean, as you will, it will become clear, Congress is, I, I admire and respect, you know, the kind of difficulty it is facing, you know, and the kind of fight it is putting up. But, you know, um, I am just being a historian and uh, point in pointing out, I, I am not uh, blaming anyone. I'm just being a historian in, in pointing out that Congress always had um, Hindu kind of forces. Um, so that's the more organized part. In some ways, even more organized part is the religious institutions. And that, you know, does not often explicitly come into the political discourse. You know, these religious institutions, you know, play a very, very large role. They are very powerful. They are half visible, half invisible. Very few of us know really about all the muts and all the religious, uh, much you must, must be understanding the sects and muts of, of, of um, various kinds within the Hindu uh, religious uh, dispensation, you know, they can put crores of people in Kumbh, you know, in Mahakumbh in, 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 in uh, Allahabad. They can put millions of Kavariyas, you know, on the Indian highways when they carry water uh, from, you know, Ganga to, to their Shivalas, you know, the Shiv, Shiv um, Bhaktas, you know. Um, 
these temples and mats and their their heads you know they are they they have immense social reach they are very rich some of these mats and 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 uh, uh, sects are richer than many of the richest corporates you know and 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 they have very uh, widespread reach very deep reach to the indian mind apart from rss and religious institutions now they also have a state and a state institutions they always have had 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 what is known as public sphere kind of institutions their publications and and their organizations and associations of various kinds and so on so that is the institutional structure of hindutva on the basis of which it can very easily propagate its idea of india you know that uh, uh, we should keep in mind and then there is this social cultural ecology about which we will talk more um, they very easily resonate with the indian mind the constraints that they have it's not that they don't have constraints they 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 do have constraints and it at times you know it appears quite admirable the way they have persisted and they, the way they have fought against their constraints for example after gandhi's assassination they were very highly discredited and 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 it has been a very steep climb for them um to to get into you know get over that uh, that discredit you know uh, that unpopularity you know uh, that's an example of how persistent they have been you know the the more important part you know of uh, the constraints they face is the fact that india is a modern and constitutional democratic republic even if it is shaky and they have made it more shaky but it is nevertheless a modern republic it is difficult to replace for them the constitution and replace it with something like manusmriti or something so that itself the 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 political framework and the institutional framework that now we should appreciate the difficulty with which you know people like jawaharlal nehru would have created it you know in a society which was even less modern than we have it today you know um that that framework that political institutional framework of a modern republic that is the biggest constraint they have even though it is true democracy it is through the same framework that they have come in a position of hegemony and they and 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 and, and a position of power so that that may sound uh, contradictory but that's that's a fact you know the 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 framework in which they have come to power is also a constraint for them the other big constraint they 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 face is in the hindu society itself because it because of its caste fragmentation and even that they have in various ways by very manipulative strategies sometimes this and sometimes that you know they have been able to overcome to quite some quite an extent and in this the their idea of india has played a key role in bringing about a kind of hindu unity so to speak a malignant kind of hindu unity over and above the caste fragmentation of the hindu society <clears throat> so that is the constraints they face but one central element we should uh, we should keep in mind and we should notice is that their strategy becomes effective because there is a very significant important minority religious minority in india that's that's uh, that is that is a key part of their strategy their strategy succeeds because um they can point to 15% of the population as someone who is not fully indian or who can be blamed for many um historical um problems or disasters in their <coughs> eyes that india has faced and this model of um, ideological strategy you know is very well known all over the world you know i mean of course you know uh, the much repeated one is germany of of hitler germany of first half of 
20th century when uh, probably a smaller percentage wise uh, than Muslims in India, but is still a very significant, very easily identifiable and very influential minority, you know, in some ways influential um, uh, minority Jews were targeted on a on a on a race, racist or racial kind of ground, you know, again Aryan versus Jews, and that strategy, as long as it worked before it led whole of Germany to complete disaster, you know, it was very successful. So we should keep that in mind that that is the central part, uh, central central foundation of their strategy. And you could you could also notice that there are many ancient civilizations which can take pride in being great civilizations and so on. Uh, Greece, Egypt, Iran, China, and so on, including India. You know. And not everywhere the ancient glory comes into contem contemporary political play as it does here in India. I'm not saying that it comes into play only in India, in a way it is coming into play in many different countries in the world. And there are other reasons also why it becomes effective other than having a significant minority that can be identified and that can be painted as the other of the, 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 the civilization. Um, for example, you know, you know, in Turkey today or, or, or even in Iran or in much of, you know, um, that part of the world, um, the Western modernity itself becomes a civilizational other, you know, and um, gives a lot of a strength to religion-based ideological strategies. But that's a different kind, and we are not going to um, uh, to deal with that kind that kind of problem this afternoon. So this 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 central plank of their ideological strategy is based on a what I often call the social tectonic plate of our society, Indian society, which is the Hindu-Muslim divide. And this, this Hindu-Muslim divide, you have to have a very, you know, very realistic assessment of it. It's a real divide. That doesn't mean that when you accept it as a real divide, you know, you are endorsing that divide or you are going to relinquish your modernist secular position. But this romantic, starry-eyed secularism that thinks that there is no problem before the Britishers came or before these malignant forces like, you know, Hindutva and RSS came, Hindus and Muslims where there was no big difference and we were all together and then we never fought with each other and there was no violence and there was no problem, everything was hunky-dory. That kind of uh, romantic idea we should not have. You know. This divide is very deep. Uh, in one lecture and in one, in one afternoon, we cannot go into the whole historical account of how this divide had become so deep and all pervasive in the Indian mind from both sides, you know, uh, from the majority side and from, from the minority side. Um, uh, so, but, but we should take, we should recognize that this is a real divide. So that part, that is basically all you know. I mean, I haven't said anything new. Uh, all, uh, that is the plank of Hindutva's idea of India and why it succeeds, why it has succeeded to the extent it has succeeded. Now we should uh, we should come. I'll come to the second part, uh, second topic. Let us say, is that why has opposition failed? Why have opposition forces failed? Well, once they were very successful. In fact, who uh, the, the 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 forces who are in opposition today, who are in, they are the ones who were the hegemonic, dominant, ideologically dominant forces only, you know, 70 years ago, at the, you know, in the national movement, as well as in the soon after uh, uh, we gained independence. You know. So they were very successful. Congress hegemony, you know, um, now we should realize that how good it was compared to the other hegemony that we are living under, you know, um, relatively speaking. Congress hegemony was responsible for that. And that period, was, that period of Congress hegemony was good for left also. 
we as leftists always complained against the Congress hegemony, and we were the main opposition, you know, in the first uh, first parliament. You know, CPI was the main opposition party, and all various you know divided, fragmented left was united, you know, more or less in opposition to Congress. You know. But still, uh, that was a relatively good period of us. In a way, Congress hegemony was good for the main opposition to Congress, which was which was left, you know, and we should think about that. You know. um, the failure of opposition, leftist and non-leftist uh, included, you know, all the what I would call modernist um, forces, you know, uh, the failure is deeply correlated with emergence of vigorous electoral democracy in a traditional, largely religious and, and, and society in which this kind of tectonic plate, Hindu-Muslim divide exists. You know. and that's a statement of fact. You know, I am not giving any value judgment. I am not passing any value judgment on desirability or undesirability of democracy itself. I'm just stating a fact that as democracy has become vigorous and it has become vigorous after the decline of Congress hegemony. It has taken 40, 50 years after the independence for Congress to start declining. And it took another 15, 20 years for that process of decline to, 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 to pick up speed. Um, the decline of Congress, ironically, you know, which has, which is which has turned out to be so problematic for whole of India and especially for left. You know um, that uh, that decline was instrumental in making the the democracy, electoral democracy, vigorous. You know, ironically, you know, in our society because of the nature of our society. That's the that is what we have to to, to understand. How did that happen? Because that is key. To the failure of uh, or, or or failure of opposition to mount any kind of effective challenge to the Hindutva hegemony today. And let me briefly just first deal with left and what I will call the social movements. Why, how their failure uh, one tries to understand, and then I will move on to what I will call the main oppositional force. You know, which is the which is in our jargon, in our leftist jargon, we call what we call the, 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 the liberal bourgeois, so to speak, you know, those forces, they are the main opposition, you know, um, and we will see, we will see how we have misunderstood, we leftists, most of left have misunderstood the kind of relationship that should be there between leftists and the progressive bourgeois, you know, in a traditionally traditional society like ours, why we have misunderstood that, why we have not um, taken care of that relationship very well, you know, what kind of, <clears throat> why we became partly blind to this impending danger that is that is now come full, full bloom, namely the Hindutva hegemony. But I will come to that uh, a little later. First, the failure of left. By left, I mean, I mean, it is identified with, in India, it is identified with three aspects, you know, what one can call class struggle, trade unions, and peasant organizations, and so on. And then social movements, you know, caste struggles, uh, struggles against caste oppression, Dalit movement, even though the relationship between Dalit movement and left movement, it is quite adversarial, unfortunately. But I will come to it again that it is not true that left has not paid attention to social movements and electoral politics. These three things together, you know, uh, electoral politics under various kinds of communist parties, you know. In, in India is a country, India is a society that probably has largest number of different kinds of leftists, leftists you know, still. Now it is said that they have failed, you know, I mean, main things quickly, you know, uh, <clears throat> that they have an alien theory, Marxism and so on. These are alien theories, you know, and so on. And it cannot grow on the Indian soil. It's, you know, people have always preached 
to the leftist, you know, that, oh, what, you know, you, you will never be able to understand India, you know, and so on, especially the, the, the Indian version of socialists, you know, which are actually, we will see quite right wing, you know, and the Lohia and so on kind of uh, uh, socialist, you know, they have always preached that your socialism will never grow in India, you know, I mean, Indian soil, you know, will not nurse it, you know, will not nurture it. Why? Because you have an alien feeling. But you know, I mean, this, this um, really is a, is a phony accusation. You know? Theory, no theory, you know, I mean, theory doesn't have a country. No theory has a country. It may be born in a country. It may be born in a person's head to start with, and that person may belong to a country, or to, a, to, to, a, to a language or to a culture. Everything, when it gets born, you know, whether it is theory or it is nation or it is uh, some ideology, the, the birth always is very messy. There is never something like an immaculate conception, you know. So no matter how a theory is born, once it becomes a theory, uh, it, it doesn't have a country. And that doesn't apply only to Marxism. That applies to even whatever theory you distill in Gandhi, in Tagore, of course in Nehru. And I will go to the extent, we will not have time to discuss that, but I you know, am of the opinion that theory, even that is associated to people like Vivekananda and Aurobindo, are not indigenous theories. There are there is theoretical core that is borrowed, you know, from elsewhere, from modernity, and then it is admixed in an alchemic, you know, alchemy kind of fashion with Indian religiosity and so on. You know, no theory per se is Indian, and 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 theory does not reach politics, you know, wearing a badge that it, it is Indian or it is foreign. By the time theory reaches people, you know, it is, it doesn't reaches people in the, with the identity of a theory and so on. It, it always reaches people through politics, through struggles, you know, and so on. So that's, that's, that's not really why left has failed because it subscribes to an alien theory. Everybody subscribes to an alien theory. Then you, left is accused that, oh, they don't go to people. And not only others say that they don't go to people, more than others, leftists tell each other that they don't go to people. You know, hypothetically, you can come across two people by the roadside arguing very loudly with each other and you pay attention and, and you find out that they are saying to each other, oh, go to people, go to the people, go to the people. Each one of them both of them are saying the same thing to each other. Go to the people. You know. They are not making any move to go to the people. Neither are they making any move to go to the library. But they are just making a big point, big argument about why you know, the, 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 the talisman is that go, go, go to the people. It has degenerated even more in our, in our you know, smaller leftist groups. You know. We just examine each other credentials. You know. Much of our work goes into examining each other credential. How much sacrifice you have moved? How committed you are? Have you walked with the com comrades in the forest through the night? Have, you know, have you been jailed? Have you been tortured? You know, were you in the heat of May you know, on the factory gate? You know, or are you sitting in your uh, AC room or whatever? You know, we, 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 we just keep on examining the credentials of each other and then accusing each other of various kinds of you know, various forms of being traitors or revisionists or whatever, you know, but anyway, that, 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 by the way, this going to the people, the fact is that left has always gone to the people, even though dogma on its lips, you know, whenever it writes its, its party program, or whenever it writes anything, you know, some, 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 um, some form of some some dogmatic expression of theory will be there, but no one can accuse of left going to, to not going to the people. Left has always gone to the people. Left has always been with the people, you know, and yet it has failed. So the failure is somewhere else. Then people say that related to the first point, alien theory, that you have, you do not 
understand the social reality. For example, you do not understand caste. You just keep on talking about class, you know, but you know that in India, you know, uh, Indian society is identified with caste, you know, and, and, and now partly that accusation sticks, you know, but it's, it, it sticks only in the theory part, you know, in the theory part uh, that, that what we say, what we are in our articulation, in our theorizations, even in the caste related social movements, left has been present and left has played a role. But let me move on, you know, I mean, I'm not saying what, what is the failure of left and I'm not explaining it. I am just saying that whatever popular explanations are there, you know, they don't hold water. But if it was true that left failed because it did not recognize Indian social reality, then others who do recognize Indian social reality and keep on underlining that, you know, particularity of Indian social reality, they should have succeeded. So the social movements, various social movements should have succeeded. Social movements, you know, based on caste, based on gen gender, based on nativity, based on maybe at times language, you know, you can count many, many different kinds of social movements. They should have succeeded. And I will not, you know, take too much time in going into each one kind, each one of them in detail, but I will just take um, the example, very briefly, the example of Dalit movement. How should we, how should Dalit movement evaluate itself? Look at what has happened. Look at the icons of today. Look at people like, like Mayavati or, or Athavale, you know, Athavale who has a, a, his origin in, you know, Dalit Panther something and the party's name is that of Ambedkar's party's name, RPI, you know. He is minister in this regime, you know, and uh, uh, the kind of, you know, his, his behavior, his political behavior for, for all of you to see. You know, what a tragedy, what a mockery of, of being a leader of, of the Dalit movement. So Dalit movement has has been hammered even badly, even much worse than the left movement. It has been co-opted largely. It has, you know, I mean, Dalit movement, the radical form of Dalit movement and that articulation survives only in the Dalit ideologues. In the movement itself, there is not much there. Occasionally, there is a resistant movement. Some gruesome kind of violence, you know, happens. The violence against Dalits happens all the time, every day, every day. But some, some, some gruesome violence happens. And for various reasons, you know, it picks up momentum. Some hero emerges, you know, based on that resistant movement, you know. And after some time, you know, such temporary heroes disappear. So either the ideologues have very radical articulation of Dalit movement, or there are these occasional temporary heroes where, you know, other than that, where or most of it is co-opted by Hindutva itself, where is Dalit movement? So why did they fail? Why did social movements fail? We will come to that, you know, that the theory part when we come to that how certain kinds of theories, when they imagine that India will be a place of million, million social movements, which will lead to an, a, 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 a largely a stateless and and communitarian kind of, you know, some kind of uh, anarchist kind of paradise, you know, those million movements um, driving the Indian politics or driving the world politics, you know, has not succeeded, you know, and we will have to keep that mind, that failure too. More important is the failure of the liberal secular bourgeois, because that has been the principal architect of modern India. And I mean Nehru's Congress or Nehru's part of Congress. Congress was always never, I mean, never it was in his, in his full control. It had all kinds of you know, very, very problematic people who would have fitted better with RSS than with Congress. But Nehru's Congress was different. Nehru's part of Congress was different, different. Nehru's vision of Congress was different. And he was the principal architect of whatever modern India we have. 
and that is why they don't like him that is why they he is the he is the he keeps on you know uh, he his his they are bothered every day by his ghost you know so why did something that started as gloriously in much more difficult conditions why did that fail and that is something that is much more um, that gives much more insight why are they in such difficult conditions that they cannot the liberal bourgeois secular forces cannot mount a an effective challenge to the hindutva hegemony and this is something you know i will not try to answer you know it at, at one go i will just mention that the, uh, sometimes i call it you know um walzer's paradox you know there is a there is a princeton political philosopher his name is uh, my I, i think michael walzer walzer you know um he wrote a nice little book you know based on his lectures you know and he um took three or four countries which became independent led by the progressive bourgeoisie liberal modernist secular bourgeoisie you know uh, the national movement was led by them the the republic the constitutional modern republic was established by them the entire political framework of a state you know in that colonial country you know he takes three countries you know and there are others who have taken similar examples you know and uh, in all countries you find that after 40 50 years the religious conservatives come to power the people who are exactly opposite of 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 people like people like nehru you know or or uh, i think he takes you know he takes egypt or israel or even ireland kind of you know everywhere religious right emerges after 40 or 50 years and he lives at that he calls it the book i think you know if i remember correctly the name of the book is the the paradox of liberation so this problem that is not specific to india only that is that has happened in other countries too that in a tradition bound largely religious kind of society because of colonialism because of anti colonial mobilization modernist bourgeois forces come to the leadership of nationalist movement and they conceptualize an independent nation which is modern which is constitutional which is democratic which is secular and so on and on such foundation then democracy proceeds 20 30 40 years their hegemony rules you know that society but eventually as democracy gains ground as elections become more and more real as elections get out of the shadow of what i will call good bourgeois hegemony better bourgeois hegemony compared to what the kind of hegemony you have so the modern bourgeois hegemony as as the 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 democracy gets out of the shadow of that hegemony then the society itself the churning electoral churning electoral activism electoral political activity in the society itself throws up a new leadership which suits that society which resonates more with that society and that is not secular that is not modernist you know that is sectarian that that uses religion as 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 its basis you know and this happens this this has happened in many many countries and we are a prime example of that so so walzer's paradox you know we will have to try to understand why does this happen now quickly i will have to move to some 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 theoretical points it is not much theory you know i will deal with you know you can say that i will go through some theoretical anecdotes you know um as a preparation to un- to 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 state my position i will not be i mean these are such large questions such you know such a big crisis that we are facing and many many countries are facing that i cannot answer that no one can answer i for frankly i don't have an answer but every individual thinks and i think the kind of answer we should try to construct you know even that cannot be that 
rough idea i cannot be communicated in just one lecture in one afternoon so i will be very schematic and in order to prepare for that i will give you some theoretical anecdotes let us say you know a few years ago i think it was it was 2013 or so a very famous marxist um, scholar historian perry anderson wrote a very sloppy book on india you know it was called indian ideology he started that book you know i will not go to into the details of that book you know but he started by ridiculing nehru he started by mocking nehru that oh this guy was imagining a 6000 year old civilization where was india british created india you know there was never india you know before that it was a i will not go into you know my tirade against uh, anderson anderson is a very respectable marxist you know and i don't know why he wrote such a such a such a sloppy book you know but interesting thing for my purpose was that indian intellectuals got very worked up and many many of them wrote very acerbic very acidic very aggressive articles criticizing that you know um many of them were intellectuals of the post colonial post structural you know post this post that you know even post marxist kind you know i mean I, i will come a little bit more about this post kind of theory you know and they they just attacked anderson like any like anything i am not defending anderson probably he deserved that attack you know but interesting thing was that no one no one defended nehru the basic attack you know at least one part of attack that anderson was making that nehru was being a romantic you know a very cool hardy in imagining that for 6000 years something like india has existed you know you can only argue on that on a legalistic ground that the name india was not there or one political unit was not there but you know nehru was not talking about that nehru was talking about and in a very popular kind of book you know i mean written apparently you know as letters to his daughter you know um you know he was talking about very serious matter very deep matter he was a visionary and he was trying to make sense of what kind of india is arising against the colonials against the british and what kind of india will be the foundation of our claim to have a a a, a country and a nation and a state to ourselves you know he was dealing with very difficult problem and and he started out very well you know in fact he started out the best many people tried that but his vision stands out we will come to that a little later none of these intellectuals defended that even from our side you know i mean cpm famous economist and uh, ideologue prabhat patnaik our friend too you know um he confronted him with his pet thesis of anti colonial nationalism he was not you know that way you know proving that uh, uh, anderson was arrogant and sloppy and even orientalist eurocentric racist all kinds of things that anderson was accused of based on that sloppy book you know by these post theorists post kind of theorists you know prabhat was not doing that prabhat confronted him with his uh, pet thesis of or left pet leftist thesis of anti colonial uh, nationalism so he said that there is an different kind of nationalism and they do try to left does try to make a political point that the hindutva kind of nationalism should be confronted with anti colonial kind of nationalism but the point is main point is that the time of anti colonial was colonialism is gone i will not get into that you know i mean that, that it doesn't carry it doesn't carry political it karana padega political strength or it, it it doesn't have you know any 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 political traction um so no one defended nehru on the question of idea of india why because these theorists themselves mock any kind of met, the, what they call meta narrative they mock any kind of idea of india they have most of them have spent their intellectual academic career dissecting and deconstructing nationalism that how nationalism is a meta narrative you know nothing is behind 
that idea of 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 nationalism you know and um, uh, how i mean then their scholarships comes in you know they are great scholars they are very meticulous very rigorous scholars and they can prove through their historical research that what these nationalists assumed india was i mean india was not like that there was nev- never this and never that whatever the nationalist stream you know all the subaltern work you know kind of historians you know and other post colonial kind of historians you know they had spent their career deconstructing nationalism nationalism of the national movement nationalism of the anti colonial movement that get that grand narrative how were they going to defend nehru who was trying to visualize a civilization 6000 years old this kind of theory i don't have time today to go into that detail this kind of theory even though even though very 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 rigorous very erudite very scholarly has taken the political teeth out of political theory you know, this post colonial kind of theorizations they don't understand they themselves argue okay so let me now come to that they they their argument first is based on their conception and on some some historiographic argument you know. there also i will give you one anecdote you know i mean the in 1983 came a very famous book by the brother anderson it just so happens benedict anderson who was elder brother of of uh, of of perry anderson his famous book came about you know uh, which talked that nations are imagined political communities and i find that say you know that say i will advise those of you who haven't gone through that book to go through that you know that say that that became very famous and that is a brilliant piece of theorization i have no problem in accepting that nation is an imagined community because he is very clear and he is very precise in defining what he means by imagine he says that the members of this any nation will never know each other will never meet each other will never come face all of them will come to face to face with each other so each one of them imagines that he is part of the same nation part of a uh, part of a community you know and i have no problem with that definition of being imagined but this word imagine which i have deliberately used in the title of my talk also you know imagining india this word imagining became very popular in the theoretical uh, circles there was even an antecedent to that you know the another famous theorist who was not a marxist benedict anderson who wrote that book on nationalism in 1983 is a was a marxist but another theorist cornelius castoriadis you know he in 1975 had come up with a book which became a, a rage you know became very very famous very 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 popular you know in theoretical circles it was called the imaginary institution of society and he was the one who is credited with coming up with this theoretical concept of something called social imaginary social imaginary means you know he even said that you know again very involved very complex theory but uh, i am caricaturing it but he said that you know societies are all you know are very real but they are imagined so they are such imaginary things which become real and if many people together imagine the same thing then it becomes real you know i mean it's a believable 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 theory you know yes you know even god becomes real if humanity you know large part of humanity starts um, uh, uh, imagining god and he becomes a real force to reckon with you know uh, in the form of religion so yes i can accept that society you know is an imaginary institution but then this imaginary world was misused also this imaginary world was misused you know in many different ways i will not go into uh, caricaturing those but i will just take the best example of that you know whom again a, a, a theorist whom i admire among indian theorists you know sudipta kaviraj he wrote a very famous article in 1992 which was called the imaginary institution of india and i am not saying that he is misusing the concept it's a very erudite article well argued article the complaint i have is that 
the out of all that theoretical analysis a clear kind of politics does not come out of it no and i don't don't uh, uh, please don't uh, think that i am expecting politics to come out in a dogmatic typical leftist way out of every theoretical work no i am not but i i am careful i respect a theoretical work as theory i try to learn from it and yet i have that complaint that that imaginary institution of india because this whole post colonial kind of historians he is not a fully one typical kind of post colonial theorist he is different from most of the sub subaltern um historians and 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 theorists and yet you know he somehow falls in that large constellation i cannot put my fingers exactly on i am not a theorist or a scholar of that kind how does he falls in that constellation i don't know but roughly in my eyes he falls in that const constellation and he he they it's it they go over to say and by the way that point also i accept they go over to say that there cannot be objective history that is true there cannot be an objective history But because even the best after best historical research you can prove the objectivity of an event objectivity of an episode of events you know but you cannot causally connect different events in a decisive way in a way that you know that cannot be refuted so whenever you write history you have events but you have causal connection too and that causal connection between events this led to that is often not established objectively or scientifically it is often imposed by the historian on those objective events from by hand as a narrative you know the historian is a, as a plausible narrative that this happened and that happened and this event led to that event and that led to that event and that way all history is narrated i accept that you know what do i not accept what i don't accept is that i you cannot accuse somebody of of um, of uh, you cannot be selective about accusing that somebody is claiming to have an objective history decisive history only one history it is true that history will always be written from some vantage point some stand point history will always be written from the vantage point of the present some kind of narrative imposition will always be there on history but everybody has that right so we leftists have that right too nationalists have that right too you cannot just say that you know you cannot just say that i will deconstruct nationalists i will deconstruct you know leftists you know then 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 uh, what kind of privileging uh, should be done to which kind of history are you going to stop at saying that no history is possible of course you don't say that of course you write history you are a historian and you are a theorist of history and then you cannot just stop at saying that no history is possible and we we accept that yes history is from a standpoint but anybody has a right to history right to writing history from that standpoint and what i am going to argue after this theoretical kind of anecdotal interlude i am going to 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 argue that the modernists in india have to lay claim to india modernists in india have to have their own idea of india nehru was starting that process nehru was starting that process that got mocked by all kinds of theorists and that got mocked even by us that got mocked even by you know leftists you know and when we we at times we realize that no no some kind of idea is needed because of our weaknesses because of our theoretical weaknesses we made a mess of it we made a mess of it somebody made a bigger mess like dange or somebody made a smaller mess like damodaran you know but everybody may, made some kind of mess so we attacked nehru for trying to come up with an idea of india in that we joined all these you know you know post kind of theorists you know even before they came on the scene 
and they became dominant on the theoretical scene. And whenever we realized that, no, no, we also need an idea of India, we made a mess of it. We made a very bad idea of India, you know, in which, you know, we, we, we tried to look at history from the perspective, you know, of always from the perspective of uh, a limited perspective of class struggle. And I, I will come to that in a minute, you know, that why that does not suffice, even though that is the central point of our theorization, class relations and class struggle, that does not suffice, you know, when you come to the problem of constructing an idea of India, you know, laying claim to a civilization, laying claim to thousands of years of history, just the specs of class struggle will not suffice. My assertion is that the mythical India, which is the basis of their ideological hegemony, must be confronted with historical India. And you will say, what big deal, you know? But no, it is a big deal. This project has not been done. It is not about writing a book or writing an article. It is a project of translating that into political forces. It is an, a project of translating that kind of idea of India into a political force, the way they have translated you know, their idea of mythical India into a political force. Mythical India is even, is, is um, intellectually, rationally is, is, is even more laughable. And look, yet they have turned into a formidable political engine, formidable political force. They have been supported in this by the religiosity of India, by all the religious institutions, everything that I talked about in the beginning. You know. But for whatever, you know, whatever has helped them, they have been able to accomplish that. And the project of turning historical India, which is as much an imagined India, I should again clarify, I am not claiming to any objective history. I recognize that objective history is impossible. I recognize that, in, in the, that, that any history will be written from some vantage point of the present. And our vantage point, our standpoint, from which we should make, lay claim to India, lay claim to the idea of India, that should be the modernist claim. That should be the modernist vantage point. You know. And there is a lot in there. You know, in this simple sentence, there is a lot of worried which, you know, which will be very controversial and that will give rise to many, many debates, hopefully, you know, within the left circles, you know, about that. So the, 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 my assertion is that we, we take up this project, the modernist forces, leftist included, must sincerely, urgently take up this project of lay claim to idea of India from a modernist viewpoint, this will not be a monopoly of leftists. Leftists will not have, they cannot have a separate idea of India. You know, many ideas of India's will not survive. You know, they will not gain political traction. You know, this modernist standpoint will be roped into claiming the idea of India, how I will just give you again, it's a large subject and we are just starting out on that theoretical political journey. So I will just give you some caricature like, you know, example, you know, if they say Ram is the central figure, you know, and they worship Ram, don't laugh at me, I am going to give a caricature like example. We say that we admire the creative genius of Valmiki. We say that Valmiki was writing in a very developed language an epic that is, that is great epic. You know, I'm not going into the normative ethical dimensions of Ram's life, you know, or what Valmiki wrote, you know, but, you know, you have to be historical. You cannot judge Valmiki on today's criteria on, to, 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 you know, on, on, you know, Valmiki was two and a half thousand or three thousand years ago. You know. So now, but this is a big shift, you know, you know, the Western civilization that arose out of, out of Greek, uh, Greek uh, theory and philosophy and and civilization, they don't worship Apollo or even the more human figures of Achilles or Hector or whatever. 
they admire homer they emphasize the fact that homer created those epics you know and in order to become in order to recognize as a civilized greek you had to know your homer and on that then later others got added to philosophy and geometry and everything got added you know through the centuries that followed you know we will not don't have time to go into the detail but i am just contrasting that so we say that ram is a character in the great epic of valmiki you know and we are a civilization that starts out from valmiki and vyas and kalidas you know and yes tulsidas too i will come to that a little later but definitely galib and come all the way to tagore we start out from real historical figures figures like buddha and ashok and come to akbar the peak of indian prosperity you know akbar's period that they would like to forget they would never mention akbar they would never mention the medieval period which was the greatest period in indian history when more than a quarter of world you know gdp or world product was produced by india the way america was a few till few years ago that kind of weight indian economy and indian civilization had in the world you know and that was akbar's india you know we will we will highlight that they will forget that they will create an artificial you so i mean i do not know um, you know the cultural mind of south india for example that well but i can tell you about the cultural mind in the hindi heartland it is constructed largely by tulsidas and tulsidas is ramcharit manas and if you enlarge it you know if you then bring in the the secondary sects and like kabir panth and nath panth and so on you know uh, and gorakh panth and so on you know, what happened to nath panth or gorakh panth you know you know the the present heir to that panth is the chief minister of uttar pradesh you know but that apart you know um what happened to those panth even if you add all those panths you what you come up with the bhakti movement the india hindi literateers call that period the golden period of of hindi literature and what was this bhakti literature apart from the fact you can argue and that part i admire that you know it challenge caste systems and those so on but you know i mean in, in most of in all of bhakti sahitya there is no mention of contemporary society of that time with few exceptions like jaisis padmavat which 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 does mention alaudin khilji you know and so on a, a few references here and there can you imagine the entire literature of an entire period not having an inkling about what was the society and what was the politics of that society it was an everybody you know this hindu hindu muslim tectonic plate this hindu muslim divide has not arisen you know just uh, spontaneously there has been a 500 year long history to create that divide you know from both the sides from one side it was invasion from outside political rule and every political rule will come with oppression so i am not saying that the islamic rule or mughal rule was all very you know respecting the the charter of human rights you know nobody is respected the charter of human rights you know those days everybody was was brutal everybody was oppressive so there was problem from the side of power and what was the 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 what was the answer from the other side escape ignore that you know santan ko ka si kari so kaam you know what do saints have to do with centers of power you know go into the go to the bhakti marg and take the entire society entire people who are oppressed by the the rulers of those times but you don't have any recourse to fight them you don't have any resources to fight them take them on a escapist route you know that you know we have our own way of life we have our own culture and we have our own road to god you know so will we ever talk about this escapist aspect of of literature of that time this was created for whatever reason i will not say i don't i'm not a historian i don't know de deliberately deliberately or, or or not this was created but the story did not stop there the way hindi language itself was created you know was 
by from the hindu side first the hindu side first separated you know the khadi boli that we use which is the basis of modern you know hindi you know uh, grammatical infrastructure of modern hindi is same as urdu that infrastructure that started in 12th 13th or 14th century and there is no talk of that what happened to that khadi boli any literature was, or urdu any literature was generated in that in 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 that in that language in khadi boli in rekhta or in urdu whatever you call it that is absent from much of the hindi cultural mind hindi cultural mind recognizes only the bhakti literature avadhi braj bhasha and so on and this was when you come to 19th century when hindi deliberately and politically is separated from urdu you know this this is being done by the communal hindu forces you know like bhartendu harishchandra like others whose name i forget but definitely you know madan mohan malviya later so so earlier bhartendu harishchandra and later madan mohan malviya and they met they knew each other young madan mohan malviya knew bhartendu harishchandra and these communal people like bhartendu harishchandra and and madan mohan malviya they are the ones who created quote and quote created modern hindi so modern hindi was created on a communal basis on an amnesia on forgetting about 600 or 800 years of indian history one of the most glorious periods of indian history was deliberately forgotten you know in all this literary and cultural discourse in all this concoction that is known as hindi literature artificially separated from urdu literature so you know this this you know this all will come i mean i digressed a little bit here but this all will come into how historical india will be created you know in you know they it will take different forms in different languages maybe maybe in different uh, cultural settings but historical india will have to be meticulously deliberately constructed and then it will have take it will have to be taken to the political field now i have taken my time but just give me a few more minutes you know to 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 make a few points and then conclude um there are tricky questions and i am not saying that it will it is going to be easy you know i will just for few minutes deal with two questions how will a dalit for example lay claim to this idea of india what does dalit do to a valmiki i mean don't confuse don't confuse the valmiki you know there is a dalit subcaste also known as valmiki you know i mean the valmiki the creator of ramayana creator of the character of ram creator of the character of maryada purushottam you know which was you know i don't know whether he called him maryada purushottam or not or he was late by called by some others i am not a scholar of literature but what should be the attitude of dalits to a valmiki what should be the attitude of a dalit to a kalidas what should be the attitude of a dalit to a ghalib or what should be an attitude of a dalit even to rabindra tagore so whether valmiki starting with valmiki and vyas going through the classical period of kalidas and bhas and banabhat and whoever coming all the way to kalhans raj tarangini all the sanskrit classical sanskrit literature what should be the attitude of dalits and dalit movement to the classical india now that's a tough question that is a tough question but dalit movement will have to think about it the way the hindutva forces have wiped out from the historical memory the entire muslim period if that is the if that is the strategy you adopt then dalits and women will have to erase whole of india from the memory is that possible whole of india entire india in its entire history has been anti dalit and anti women and anti many many other people too but you know th these are large examples anti dalit and anti women so how do we claim history of a civilization even if we have been always oppressed by that history how do we make a claim to that history 
how should the slaves claim make a claim to history of the western civilization will they feel happy about the fact that lincoln abolished slavery at least formally or was lincoln a white was lincoln a white ruler and so on so must be wiped out from memory now in dalit movement and now i am talking of dalit ideologues if the if the whole emphasis is that before you speak about the dalit issue before you speak about the dalit question before you speak about the dalit issue ask yourself what is your caste standpoint which caste you were born into are you a savarna then do you have a right to speak you know um, about something that relates to dalit again i am sorry i am caricaturing a little bit it is maybe not as blunt but this kind of attitude comes through from the theorization of dalit ideologues when you are emphasizing the experiential aspect of dalit life that those who have experienced when you are experiences that theory is embodied in the dalit so in this phenomenological kind of theory of embodied dalit experience you know only out of that can come a authentic narrative you know of history in of which dalits were part you know then i think you know we will have to rethink how will dalits lay claim to the idea of india and that is why deliberately i call it historical idea of india historical india because you cannot judge a kalidas on the basis of what caste he was born into now that part, that thing is gone when you were there in time of kalidas and if dalit movement was there things would have been different but now kalidas is something else kal we don't have an option we have to choose do we own kalidas or not do we feel proud of kalidas or not because kalidas is our peak now somebody will throw away kalidas because he wrote in sanskrit somebody will throw away kalidas because if he existed you know he is not a fully established you know historical figure but you know if he existed most likely he was a brahmin you know could that be the basis of judging you know the those pointers those points through which you construct your map of india your map of civilizational india or your civilizational map of india that is something we will have to think about i feel that we will have to rethink and dalits will have to cl lay claim to kalidas too dalits will have to lay claim to balmiki too the way they lay claim to buddha the way they would lay claim to maybe ashoka they should lay claim to akbar they should lay claim to nehru also because our civilization in you know i will put it crudely our civilization is identified by with such people buddha ashok akbar and nehru for me these are you know this is what the what i am saying my idea of india even though i am a leftist and i love bhagat singh more than i love nehru and yet i am not sticking my neck out and i am not identifying bhagat singh with the civilizational identity of india the meaning of bhagat singh is something else but the meaning of buddha ashok akbar and nehru you know that is a different meaning the deliberate omissions that i am making there are obvious you know and i will not go into that you no know, you know i am not taking gandhi's name for example even though i will have if you force me i will include that you know but for me for me the modernist for me the modernist standpoint from where i will claim the idea of india nehru you know is the modern peak so and same way about in in literature in ideas you know uh, valmiki vyas kalidas bhas you know kalhan then mir ghalib why not why only tulsidas why only surdas and 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 all the way to rabindranath tagore even though rabindranath tagore i know was a mystic and i am not you know uh, he was irrational i when i feel when I, mean, i read his his conversation with the, with the, with the, with the einstein those three four pages you should read i almost feel ashamed you know the kind of nonsense he is talking about and the kind of since einstein is talking about 10 years is younger or 15 not 10 years you know i mean 18 years is younger you know, than 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 rabindranath tagore and yet i am proud of rabindranath tagore you know 
so you know these are very complex things you know i mean it's i am proud of tagore that doesn't mean that i subscribe to everything that tagore believed in i subscribe to everything that kalidas believed in or i subscribe to everything that valmiki prescribed as a in norm norm of a society you know through his epic you know i don't subscribe to that and yet i feel proud of that that is how the leftist will have to be think will have to think and that is how the dalits will have to think also. well i have um, i think i will leave it at that i will conclude here there is a big point about leftist that how leftists you know well just a few sentences there is there are there is are, there will be big controversies about what i am saying you know in the leftist circles because they will say a standard leftist theory will say that what are you talking about all this superstructure you are giving all this weight to superstructure this you know idea of india is this is this what has become central to you what happened to the material foundations what happened to the production relations what happened to the class struggle where have you gone you know this was not expected of you i have we in nsi have a very consistent very marxist very confident marxist theory you know about separating the social totality into system and rest of society all that base and superstructure applies to the system part production relations being the foundation class relations being the foundation giving rise to the superstructure of a state giving rise to the superstructure of laws and the institutions and so on all that we subscribe to but if you subtract the system part of society do you get a zero no you still are left with lot of things that are in, in that are society pure society not you know the caste is not not a superstructure and caste is not a class relation either so what is it it is neither a class relation nor it is just a superstructure not it, it is just a idea it is a very material social relation and yet you know it does not arise directly out of the dynamics of production relation some many thousand of years ago it may have arisen you know in the production relation of those times who knows nobody has a a a, a really rigorous theory of caste nobody has nobody has a theory of caste so so uh, but now you cannot say that caste is class relation in india or caste is just superstructure you know so there are there is lot of society is left out when you subtract system from society our slogan in the system part is socialism we are opposed to capitalism that is why we are leftists we are leftists because we are critics of capitalism and we still believe in socialism not the socialism of the 20th century socialism of the future 20th century socialism did a glorious job of the the good part of it was that but it 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 uh, uh, it is not a model for future socialism it did its job in those conditions and then it degenerated you know because its time was over so the system part we have the slogan socialism what is our slogan what is the slogan of a leftist you know in the society part that slogan is modernity and now you know it becomes such so such so controversial that modernity is such an abused term in the theoretical circles you know people will say oh this guy he is a he 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 is a he is an idiot you know he doesn't know any theory he doesn't know that modernity is gone now post modernity you know is is you know, that time is coming in all the 50 years last 50 years of theory you know is largely hocus pocus you know it has to be you know that has to be recognized as that you know i know a lot of scholarship was there a lot of fine work was done but all this fine needle work a lifetime of needle work can make you blind to the larger picture a lifetime of very rigorous rigorous needle work can make you blind you know to the big picture you know to the to the to the politics of the era and that is why the 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 theory of last 50 years has not resulted in an active politics politics a successful politics has not arisen from the theory you know fashionable theory or more popular theory of last 50 years and that's a tragedy of our times you know and there are many reasons for that you know those reasons are in the global structure you know 
in the academia, structure of academia, how theories become hegemonic, you know, and all those things. I will not go into those things. So though I don't take modernity, you know, is as an abused, abusive term. I take modernity simple as two things: rationality and equality, reason and human equality. That is modernity. And as Voltaire told Rousseau, who was critiquing the whole civilization, he wrote to Rousseau that you have proposed that we should we should go back on four. You know that I left in my childhood. You know, going back on four means you know walking on four. You know your hand and feet. You know on your knees. You know or walking like an four-legged animal. You know Voltaire told Rousseau that I am not ready to go on on back on four. You know so there is no go in going back on four. Modernity is not going to return. Capitalism is not permanent. Permanent. Capitalism will end. It may end abruptly. It may end over a period of time. You know, but there is a definite end of capitalism. Humanity will progress to the next way of living. You know, next system. You know, which we believe will be socialist system of some kind. Will be the socialist system of future. You know, but. There is no such end to modernity. If you say that everything has an end, then I will say, in a theoretical, mathematical term, that modernity will have only an asymptotic end. We, it will approach its ends, but never will exactly come to that end. It will keep on reforming itself, just as science progresses not by interacting with non-science. Science progresses by critiquing itself. Science progresses by improving itself. Science progresses by Getting over its own boundaries and limitations, same way modernity will improve by crossing its own boundaries and going to the to 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 the better and you know fitting itself into a better and better social cultural ecology. So modernity will change, but basically it will not change. Basically, it will be based on reason and human equality. Those are the two, and nobody has an alternate to that. There will never be an alternative to that. So, whatever political ideology you subscribe to, or whatever political ideology you come to in the social sector, in the sector of society, I am not talking of the system part, not the state and economy and constitution and laws. No, though that is the system part. In the in the society part, modernity is an epochal slogan. It will more or less always be there, even though it will keep on changing, and there will never going to be a postmodern era. Postmodern era is a chimera, is an illusion by some overambitious, you know, and I will say careerist intellectuals and theorists, you know. So, so that's what are the political implications? That's few sentences, and I will conclude. The historical idea of India. I am not saying that today you get the idea and tomorrow it turns into politics. It will be a very steep climb. as steep a climb or maybe even a steeper climb than it was for for mythical india for hindutva india they were supported by our society we will not be as much supported by our society but if it if it was possible for pe people like nehru to turn into a political force to some extent helped by anti colonial struggle in a much more difficult situation than today then i believe that modernist forces today can turn it into a political force it will take multi prong you know activism you know it will take you know if they if they spoil destroy all the intellectual heritage that we have all the intellectual cultural part that we have if they go after nehru and also against jnu you know if do if they throw all all the likes of us into jail or 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 eliminate us you know still modernity will not be eliminated because modernity has taken roots in our traditional society but still it has taken roots it has taken roots through a modern republic through a modern constitution through a modern world and through the ideas it has taken roots now we are much better place to make a claim to historical idea of india and turn into a turn into a political force and for that you know i mean one more point is point of populism you know there is conservative populism on the uh, that we are faced with religious conservative populism you know uh, and it is a very real populism populism of hindutva but on our side also there is mostly populism there is you know our dogmatic kind of populism 
which you know leftist dogmatic populism which is mostly populist in in deeds and dogmatic in words we write our programs you know and documents and forget about that and we just proceed our politics with 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 populism so most of left is dogmatic populist most of social movements dalit women's movement and so on there is a large streak of anarchist kind of populism there and we will have to critique ourselves we will have to reassess ourselves you know this populism has to go and values have to come the the place we have to determine our civilizational cultural as well as ideological and theoretical values and those values for those values we should be ready to go against sections of people too to go against people too to 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 be ready to be beaten up by them and yet you know in the gandhian fashion we should say that is still this is modernity is our value so populism is a big roadblock in formulating in fashioning in fabricating a value based modern value based politics and that is what is the agenda of today in which the modernist progressive liberal bourgeois forces will have to work together with leftist forces and with the social movements that is basically you know um, our position and our assertion thank you i am sorry i have taken a little bit more time but thank you so much for your patience Uh, may I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, this was a wonderful lecture, and uh, we were all talking about uh, your lecture before you gave it to the, our friends. That this this issue of cultural hegemony has to be tackled, and you have given some insights into that. For that, I congratulate you. First, then my question is that. in many theories and understandings it is thought that uh, the pitfalls of modernity the the ethical vacuum created by the modernity is responsible for the resurgence of uh, these religious revivalistic fundamentalist forces throughout the world so how would you address to those dark parts of the modernity Uh, you can say modernity um, movement or modernity theory or whatever it is and the second question is why do you want to keep gandhi out of an idea of india thank you <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> should i answer bhargo yeah please go ahead please go a uh, very good question thank you i think it was my old friend alok tandon no yes. yeah yeah i am alok tandon um um the first question first you know when we do this theoretical kind of analysis we assume categories which are pure so even though i did not deal with modern with modernity at length but i was talking about a conceptual modernity in life never thing nothing comes you know never the concepts come walking on two legs you know in real life concepts are always entangled with other concepts in case of modernity what we have we have experienced in last 3 or 400 years of history of modernity is capitalist modernity or capitalist modernity in my own theorization is a wrong term i will not say it capitalist modernity i will say that modernity that has coexisted with capitalism in interaction with capitalism you know um but it has existed with capitalism and much of theory conflates confuses these two things and lot of the crimes of capitalism are put at the door of modernity so whatever happened in actual history in last 300 years of course people like us blame capitalism for it but largely it gets blamed in wider circles modernity is gets gets blamed for that so colonialism that becomes modernity for people and how can you subscribe to modernity don't you know that it gave rise to colonialism it subjugated you know 
the whole planet, you know, and and and, and did all kinds of brutalities. It even eliminated, you know, on the uh, on the American uh, continent, you know, it even eliminated physically eliminated civilizations, you know, and societies. So how can you say modernity? Modernity must be, you know, a very bad word, you know. And you are saying so that now you have to find out that if I am defining modernity as rationality and as equality, then did rationality and equality kill the Native Americans? Did rationality and equality was responsible for british ruling ruling over us so that i will give as an example and many many examples of this kind i can give you know let us not conflate confuse modernity with capitalism so far modernity has existed in the period of capitalism and even many many very many eminent marxist theorists i in my opinion i don't know are confused about it because they talk about singular modernity only modernity that is possible is capitalist modernity there is no other modernity so let us not only get rid of capitalism let us also get rid of modernity my position is exactly opposite let us get rid of capitalism and let us keep modernity let us keep developing modernity so i think your question is a complex one it will take uh, much thinking and much argumentation but i hope that this example of colonialism makes it clear that who do you blame colonialism for do you blame capitalism or do you blame modernity and i am not saying that capitalism did not make use of modernity capitalism did not make for example use of science i would not say it used science but do you denounce science because it was used by colonialism or because it was used by capitalism so the kind of abstraction you do there that even though science served the rulers science served the, was you not served science does not does not serve anybody but science even though science was used by the rulers you know we don't throw science into the, into the dustbin same way we don't throw modernity into the dustbin the second question gandhi you know i mean i as i say i have i mean i am a great admirer of gandhi as a political strategist without him indian independence was not thinkable nehru could not have mobilized and likes of nehru could not have mobilized you know the india of those times the traditional religious peasant india you know which needed a mahatma to mobilize them he was a great strategist and he was a political genius there is no doubt about it but i have you know when i am assessing and evaluating these personalities i am not assessing only on the basis of their political successes their actual successes i also have to evaluate where do they stand on the ideological spectrum and gandhi for me the in the ideological part of gandhi you know i have great deal of problem with because no matter how much he is admired by you know the romantic wing of today's environmentalists and mystic kinds and communitarians of many kinds you know gandhi's thesis came largely from people like russo and it was the genius of french revolution that it could use voltaire and 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 diderot and the whole bach on the one hand and also russo on the other it should be the genius of indian revolution or indian politics to be able to use gandhi and nehru together there i have great deal of admiration for gandhi but gandhi's ideological basic positions which are romantic which have never succeeded anywhere and yet he is worshiped all over the world yet he is a very un uncontroversial figure that's a that's a that's something to think about for for people like me so we will think about we will try to understand gandhi's ideological popularity all over the world even though no society or no part of any society has been able to rigorously practice gandhism put gandhism into practice the economy in the social structure in you know in the ideas and so on so gandhi was a very you know a person of the of the christ kind comes once in a millennium we may admire him and worship him i admire christ and and but i don't worship him i admire gandhi but i don't worship him and the kind of india idea of india that i want to construct nehru 
is the clear example, clear epitome of that idea. I have many, many differences with Nehru too. I have ideological differences with him. Finally, if you know, once this problem is over, our fight with, with Nehru will begin because he was not a Marxist. He was not, you know, he did not believe, you know, in the kind of socialism that we believe in. But we are not living in those times. Right now, the political agenda is something else. We don't hide our disagreement with Nehru. But the civilizational India, the idea of civilizational India that we are claiming, you know, Nehru is the last peak of that. Thank you. Thank you so much. But what about Ambedkar? He was also a modernist. Yes, yeah. we admire him, you know, you know, as much as Nehru. But you have to, you know, these are symbolic names that we are taking. And don't interpret my not taking Ambedkar's name that I am going to counterpose Ambedkar to Nehru. I have, I, I, to the extent I have no problem with Nehru, I have even less problem with Ambedkar because in many, in many senses, he was a much more consistent modernist, you know, or he at least, you know, I mean, he, he left his, his, his ministry, you know. Uh, Nehru was pragmatic in the sense of what could pass in those times. You know, take the example of Hindu court bill and all that. The point of contention between between Nehru and and, and Ambedkar. You know, so even though I would go with the kind of politically consistent position of Ambedkar, I recognize with Nehru that that was politically not feasible given the nature of Congress itself. That is an example. So 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 the, and many other names could come in. Many other names could come in. But since Nehru is the target of attack. For a definite reason, in today's ideological political dispensation, I make it a point to put him in the forefront. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. I, I uh, Kumar Ketkarji, want to <coughs> uh, express some of his views. Please, I uh, ask Kumar Ketkarji to uh, say his views. Yeah, Bhargava, I think we can take a couple of questions together, no? Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, Mayur, we can do that after uh, Kumar this. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Please, please, go ahead. Yeah, yeah actually, I don't have any uh, new comments to be made because it was a very brilliant lecture, very thought-provoking lecture. But I have just two points to make. I think very similar observations and theoretical standpoint, if I am right, was taken by Comrade Dange, whom uh, Mr. Ravi criticized. Dange used to actually, Dange was the, Dange was considered by the party as a Nehruite in the CPI, PC Doshi and Dange, and particularly Dange. And Dange introduced all kinds of uh, historical and even mythological subjects converting into history, like his book from uh, primitive to primitive communism to modernity. He has often taken similar positions, I'm not saying same positions, similar positions position that Professor Ravi has taken. And the second is, there are many right-wingers, I am not including neoliberals, many right-wingers who are not supporting the religious right. And they are, they are very secular, and yet they are completely anti-religious. And they also believe in modernity, as very correctly said. They believe in modernity, capitalist modernity. But they become an ally or enemy. Uh, I will not make, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, well versed in Dange's writings, you know, I mean, I, I'm sorry, I went by some impression that we get fed on, you know, in our circles, you know, in our training as a leftist. So as you are pointing out, I will get back to Dange and see, you know, uh, look at him again in the light of the position we have now come to. I think the neoliberals, uh, the modernist neoliberals who become an accomplice of um, of uh, the Hindutva right, you know, there in their case, I think they have made a deliberate choice. Even though they are modernist and even though they are anti-religious, they put the class question, they put the capitalist interest, they put the capitalist market interest and ideology of market and neoliberal ideology per se, you know, at the center. Whoever serves that, they will go by that. There should be not be any doubt about that. And that is why the corporate sector, by and large, has gone behind 
the the Modi regime because they think that Modi can ha handle the politics part. He can take care of you know he can win elections, take care of the uh, masses, deal with masses, so that we are free to do whatever you know we want to do. And he is a friend anyway, so he will shell out you know billions and trillions to us. You know, so they go by just self interest, and they they are being modernist is just incidental. So they are so much centered on the they put the interest of capital and their interest so much at the center that they can sacrifice their theology for that and that is why i would be very wary of them i will more put them in the enemy camp than in the friends camp so you are, you have a very um, deep question you know I mean, modernity is not a criteria even for us who are putting so much um, you know emphasis on modernity only one small rejoinder can i Can please, I have small rejoinder? Please, please, please. Only please. small rejoinder. Not. No, I will not take long. Uh, I am talking about uh, philosophers like Bertrand Russell, who did not approve of the conventional socialism of the Soviet Union. He criticized Lenin also, but he was continuous critic of the war and capitalism, which led to war. He even suffered an arrest. So, philosophical level, Bertrand Russell can we consider him as an ally in our modernity project? That's all. in one line burton russell is very much our ally because he is not uh, you know there to serve the serve the corporate interest or capital interest yeah thank you uh, ravi uh, there are many questions uh, uh, in the comment section here in the zoom and also some people post questions in facebook live also uh, maybe we will take uh, Uh, club two three questions which are similar in nature and uh, uh, go ahead with that uh, is it okay ravi yes it is okay yeah. uh, first uh, uh, let me see uh, in the here uh, comment section here in the zoom live mm. some of the some of the uh, questions are actually not questions they are trying to paraphrase what you are saying and uh, some of them are uh, clarifactory in nature for example uh, wait a second me oh. me there is one question by uh, no uh, Nujat Abbas, please. Uh, I will see. I'm missing it somewhere. Ah. Do you see any potential thinkers or figures on the horizon who are capable of taking up? the reimagining project of india today as well as in the region that is uh, south asia and uh, uh, somewhat uh, related question is uh, asked by sudhir modernity as an organizing principle or imaginary has been seen to be as pathological as the phenomenon or imaginary of nation states perhaps because both projects share the political objectives of promoting and reproducing the hegemony of privileged groups in societies across the world how can the implicit concentration or centralization of power in the proposed uh, framework yield socialism a socialism of the future and maybe i will add one more question uh, by uh, nujhat abbas again can such a project be consciously even taken up or does it evolve resulting from various often failed attempts regarding his earlier question can such a project be consciously even taken up or does it evolve resulting from various often failed attempts of constructing a uh, reimagining history for the entire south asia region that's a question he first asked so uh, can you respond to that yes thank you nuzhar i think you know i mean i would have you know i haven't seen her she is a dear friend of ours you know and she lives in uk there you know and 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 yes i 
very important question because it relates to or at least i am reading it in the quest in the light of the subcontinent you know she 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 comes from pakistan who lives in uk you know um um what i did not because of time constraint what i did not go into um uh, but i intended to say a few words i could not you know is that the idea of india that we are talking about is not confined to the political unit which is today known as india it it should be seen as a civilizational discourse applying to the whole subcontinent when people say that these entities are imagine entities one has to ask the question that how come millions or hundreds of millions of people start imagining the same thing you know the when when theorist uh, point out that these are imagined kind of uh, uh, entities nations or civilizations and so on we should ask what is wow, what makes millions or hundreds of millions of people to together in for the same thing so that means that there is some underlying thing is there we cannot exactly put our finger on it but underlying thing is there and that underlying thing you know will have its own theories one theorists have to uncover that i cannot really say who is the who is the theorist of that kind you know i mean tagore we have tagore we have he represented the subcontinental civilization from a reasonably modernist and internationalist and humanist viewpoint you know there were people before the the independence and partition you know there were other theorists also even iqbal for example started out in a different way but then went you know i mean he became the propounder of the idea of pakistan and i could not uh, i did not make this uh, statement but uh, even though the left history <clears throat> kind of position but our position is that partition was a mistake <clears throat> partition was a tragedy partition should not have happened the kind of civilizational unity we are talking about you know applies as well as there you know it is same on the the same civilization exists on the two side of 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 the today's today's boundaries you know so the 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 one of the outcomes of one of the outcomes of theorization whoever are the theorists i cannot really count but whoever may be the theorist one of the outcome of this kind of theorization will be the cultural civilizational unity of the subcontinent whether it will turn into a political unity or not it doesn't matter that depends on the global politics and global power uh, uh, system and so on and we have no immediate say on that but our policy about the cultural civilizational unity of the subcontinent is exactly opposite of the hindutva as well as for whatever you know the more virulent uh, part of the islamic fundamentalist ideology or islamic fundamentalist ideology per se you know is there both of them feed on each other both of them would like to make hindu muslim divide as the central dividing deciding factor of politics on the subcontinent and we say exactly opposite we would like to ameliorate uh, dilute the effects of this real uh, tectonic plate of hindu muslim divide and that can happen only through resurrecting the civilizational unity only through resurrecting the the medieval period which is forgotten you know the way history is taught you know in india um, or history is popularly you know um, filled into the social mind in india and i don't know what kind of history is filled into the social mind in pakistan so it will be very different from the kind of um, social mind is created here in india so i don't know i'm not directly addressing your question i couldn't even partly address uh, partly hear the question because you know of the you know some technical problem and pronunciations and language etc but if i am i hope that i am using your question nuzhab to bring what i forgot to bring or did not have time to bring one of the political implications of what i am saying is cultural civilizational unity and bringing that on the politi political agenda no matter how cloudy 
and how romantic it sounds bring that on the agenda because without that the hindu muslim tectonic plate in india will never be solved so we have a kind of vested interest we cannot solve this tectonic um, uh, problem uh, where 15% of the population is being targeted if 20% more of that population feels unity with us with our struggle you know and so that the the cultural civilizational unity does not depend on the hindu muslim divide you know we do not divide that's a real divide no matter personally people like me and you you know are not affected by that divide but um, um, we have to bring in this other narrative other discourse only then and in which the whole subcontinent will have to participate as long as pakistan is there anti pakistan nationalism here it will be defined that i am not saying that you know it's a it's a controversial statement i am not saying that pakistan should not be there and there will be a whole process how the subcontinent will in distant future will be united you know the partition was wrong we say you know i don't know what you feel about it that and what are the progressive sections in pakistan feel about that but the pro, we feel uh, that Uh, partition was wrong and that gave a strength to hindu fundamentalist here and muslim fundamentalist there thank you ravi uh, there are uh, uh, there is a question which part with which you partly responded while answering to responding to pandey ji can you hear me ravi yes yes uh, while uh, why you partly uh, uh, responded while answering to pandey ji there is another question from the fb live asked by professor devir tirmalrao from hyderabad that uh, why phule and ambedkar were not part of the reimagining of india even though uh, oh, phule and them um, oh they are very much part of it they are very much part of it when we come to the modern period we don't have to reimagine phule and ambedkar are historical figures they are our we are their people you know we fully um, subscribe to them you know more so i mean personally if you ask me more so phule than than ambedkar so there is no question of phule and ambedkar not being part of reimagining india we are reimagining india of the distant past that is what we were saying what will be the cultural civilizational basis of reimagining india and that is what i was appealing to the dalit movement also to think about that but when you come to the modern period you know um you know if you if if i had to to increase my list of course phule and ambedkar will come in that along with on 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 equal footing and in some respects even on a better footing than nehru so 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 if i can created a confusion you know i mean i should uh, you know thank you for asking that question that should be clarified i i'm sorry i also forgot to answer sudhir's question but i think that i partly answered that question when i was answering to uh, my friend alok tandan that the way i heard or understood sudhir's question was more it seems to maine abhi mobile pe laya hai kyunki aur log aa rahe hain aur udhar uncha raha hai question answer i i that question that question i that question i see more like um blaming modernity for the for for the crimes of capitalism the question of centralization of power that does not come out of modernity how can rationality and equality necessarily will lead to centralization of power that question is not causally connected the centralization of power comes out of how capitalism historical conditions in which capitalism has operated in which systems have operated in which class societies have operated and class systems have operated so modernity cannot be blamed for things like centralization of power or damaging democracy and so on even though it talks about equality does not give equality that blame cannot be put on modernity because modernity doesn't do that capitalism does that uh, and uh, <clears throat> there was a question uh, from we can say from a opposite from the opposite angle 
from asked by Dipinder Kapoor. Uh, good to think of idea of India and our history as opposed to the mythological imagination of Hinduism and history. But why give up the idea of class struggle as an integral part of social change? Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. We are never giving up the notion of class struggle. You know, absolutely. Be sure about that. Never, never, never. Because you see the system. If I did not go into the details of that, the the way I separated rest of society from system, that does not mean that I threw the system part in the analytical dustbin. System is still central for us. The central part of our politics comes out of the dynamics of the system. You know, and so the class struggle will always be a key feature of our politics, and most of our politics will arise from class struggle. because we are defined by class struggle we are defined by being critics of capitalism and being propo- proponents of socialism so that is the the key part today we were talking problem the other problem about how we conceptualize the rest of society and how do we conceptualize the civilizational cultural history and in that context we are talking about laying claim to india india it is not that cultural civilizational india belongs to someone else they are only communist you know living on an alien theory and doing class struggle from a book that was written by a german we are no such things india belongs to us we lay claim to india and we lay claim to the idea of india it is alien theory was not the problem with the leftists you know all theory is alien as far as people are concerned every kind of theory even gandhian theory is alien to indian people you know all theory are, uh, is alien but the mis- mistake we made was not alien theory but the the, the 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 in the cultural civilizational social arena we did not lay claim to idea of india that is why we got alienated you know so we are not giving up class struggle we are not giving up marxist theory we are just proposing to add something that we forgot to add in past you know which is the cultural civilizational part and cultural civilizational part is not the super structure that arises out of class struggle alone you know that is the point we are emphasizing there is the, the larger social reality the larger historical reality you know is not just the system is not just the heart is not just the core core is system but core is not the full body the the heart lives in a body the heart lives in an environment the heart lives in an interactive system and that uh, that ecology that environment is cultural social historical and we forget about that and we only keep talking about heart but heart by itself there cannot function heart by itself cannot survive so this uh, uh, there is a question uh, in fact a clarificatory uh, question by rajesh ramakrishnan i think you have actually answered that he asked please explain system and society in a little more detail i think uh, his his question partly answered by you and you want to more add more i think it is answered but i i will just repeat that the production relation economic relations you know it expresses itself into the social relations of production is the basis of foundation of system for us on that basis of production relation arises a state which is a superstructure arises constitution and laws which is which is a superstructure arises you know related ideas and philosophies which is a superstructure this constitutes the system so the system is the 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 economic base as well as the superstructure but what we are clarifying is that if you have this system which is which is economy plus politics you know crudely speaking or large part of politics you know um, not all politics large part of politics politics directly feeding into system this economy plus politics you know is the system part for us economy state constitution laws related institutions this is the system part and rest of it whatever is left over is society part of it we don't have a coherent theoretical definition of that we don't have a definition of rest of society because it is very diverse very different you know it has very diverse elements mutually interacting but is still not amenable to one theoretical definition you no know? so caste and gender and you know 
nativity and language and various kinds of identities you know and various kind of ideas relating to social behavior <laughs> and so on you know, social conduct you know and so on all that you know comes in the rest of society part so that is how it is a functional division it is not a rigorous theoretical division uh, mk sinivas is uh, commenting as well as asking a very good talk even i not being an ardent theorist i could appreciate however i have a question but we can't for a narrative to emerge shouldn't leftists learn from current struggles specifically i want the speaker's view on caa nrc agitation which overcame the polarizing forces perpetuated by hindutva and brought together disparate communities where were leftists there yes our position is clear we are <clears throat> we are against whatever this regime is doing you know in caa and all this you know counting of citizens and so on these are all you know very diabolical machinations to target a community and push that community to the wall make them you know absolutely absolutely secondary citizens and realize that you know so we don't uh, our position is clear and i thought that there is no need to you know clarify that you know the kind of people we are and the kind of audience you know gets to you know finds time for people like us you know that is not under debate so that is why i did not uh, where where the leftists you know they i mean uh, let us not blame leftists for something that they did not you know i mean for which they should not be they were always fighting all the leftists were fighting against ca all the leftists were fighting the problem we are discussing today is that why are we not effective why are they able to carry a larger part of society with them even though their programs you know relating to ca and so on you know is so inhuman so diabolical so 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 sectarian so anti human but they are able to carry large part of society and we who take correct position on these things we do not succeed as much you know so that is the problem a longer term problem we are discussing we were discussing today which will shed some light on the current struggles that that why we fail even in current struggles in current struggles why don't we have political and social influence such that we could have a larger impact on current struggles so that is part what you are asking shrivas is part of our description of our failure part of underlining the failure of left and we acknowledge that failure of left is what we are discussing that is why we have not able be able to push back this regime on all these on 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 on, on all these policies and issues so that's our failure and you are right in pointing out our failure but today we were discussing why we fail and that is a longer story and that longer story we were trying to summarize in today's talk uh while uh, uh, looking at the facebook live comments uh, i noticed a comment and somehow that comment i am unable to re re uh, trace back but i remember the question i forgot the question so i ask seek apology uh, for not able to mention the name of the uh, questioner the question is when we are imagining uh, uh, historical india uh, or uh, mm, counting the names and all that those classical era and uh, those great names are there but what about the oral tradition which are very much part of uh, the indian culture from the ancient times that's the essence of the question इनका नाम विवेक तिवारी है नो वी डू नॉट वी डू नॉट थ्रो आउट द ओरल ट्रेडिशन एंड इट इज अ ट्रेजिडी दैट ओरल ट्रेडिशन यू नो दैव नॉट बीन रिसर्च इन्वेस्टिगेटेड एज मच एज दे शुड यू नो कम टू लाइट सो वी आर लार्जली इग्नोरेंट अबाउट दैट एंड वेन द फाइंडिंग्स फ्रॉम ओरल ट्रेडिशन कम आउट देन वी विल सी then we will evaluate as we will evaluate in all the big names also that we i am not saying that we are going to accept valmiki or kalidas lock stock and barrel we will accept them as but that doesn't mean that there were no problems with them maybe i will like 
a Kalidas of Meghdoot and Ritu Samhar, but I will not like a Kalidas of Kumar Sambhav or Raghubansham. You know. So, so about the oral tradition, we have we expect that we will that into our tradition or our imagining of India. Unfortunately, one doesn't know a whole lot about that. You know, and the, the same way, I mean, in between these classical literature and the oral tradition, somehow falls the bhakti tradition. And we are not going to throw out bhakti tradition altogether either. We are going to include even the bhakti tradition. Just to clarify my point, I am taking another example that even the bhakti tradition we are going to include in the idea of India. The way I, I took the example of bhakti tradition that when Hindi mind, Hindi cultural mind talks only of the bhakti tradition and is, 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 is constructed only by the bhakti tradition and not by other literature that was being at that time, you know that Indian poets are among the greatest poets in Persian. Ghalib is a great name in Persian, you know, even in Iran. Mir is a great name, you know, in Iran. Iqbal was a great name in Iran, and all these people wrote half or more than half of their oeuvre in Persian. Lot of things were being written in Persian here. All the court records were, of course, in, in Persian, but lot of literature, I'm sure, was being generated in Persian. So we threw away Sanskrit for one reason. We threw away Persian for another reason, because all these are classical languages are, and languages of the elite and languages of the classicists and languages of the ruling class. Now that we are saying that we will rethink. So that doesn't mean that if we are going to rethink about classicist, that doesn't mean that we are going to side with the classicist and throw out the oralists, throw out the popular traditions that are there. We will adopt them too. They will be part of our Indian uh, imagination too. And thank you for asking that question. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, there is another question. Uh, there is name is not uh, getting di being displayed here. Uh, instead, uh, it is uh, his phone's name is there. One plus eight. When we talk of a socio-political project out of an idea, it is essentially forwarding of dominant values like those of rationality and equality for modernity. Contrary values or rather anti-value is the dominant idea today. How do we talk about it? Uh, this is Dr. Vikram from Raipur, and okay. you can also club my question uh, below there related to this question. Yeah, another question. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Ah. Oh. Uh, please go ahead. Can you repeat again something I missed in between? That when we when we talk of a socio-political project out of an idea, it is essentially forwarding of dominant values like those of rationality and equality for modernity. Contrary values or rather anti-value is the dominant idea today. How do we talk about it? That if 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 uh, if the hegemonic or dominant idea which are totally opposed to the ideas of equality and rationality, we don't call them modernity. No, those we don't include in part of modernity. So that again comes from this, uh, this um, 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 kind of rough thinking, roughly the thinking that whatever is happening in the modern period is because of modernity. And that is not right. You know, whatever is happening in the modern period cannot be put at the door of modernity. Modernity is a very clear thing. And that, you know, it, the, the, the debate about the actual theoretical infrastructure of modernity, the debate about that will go on forever, that what does really constitute modernity. But we, for our own theoretical as well as practical purposes, we are defining modernity based on these two legs, the legs of rationality and equality. And if something is opposed to this, then that is not modernity. And I am not saying that in the modern period, only modernity is hegemony. You know, there are periods when even in the modern period, non-modern ideas are become hegemony, or there are countries or societies or areas of the planet, regions of the planet where non-modern ideas are hegemony. And that was the whole point, you know, that we, of this afternoon's discussion, that we find ourselves in this part of the planet, on this subcontinent, and in India, 
uh, we find ourselves in this period when the non modern ideas are hegemony modern ideas were hegemonic for a short period in between in the anti colonial nationalist struggle and in the nehru period no not socially hegemonic but they were politically hegemonic and but mostly in our part of the world non modern idea ideas are hegemonic supported by the social mind so social infrastructure so of the you know the infrastructure of the social mind and we are discussing this huge problem this very complex problem that how do you in a society like ours how do you fight the hegemony of non modern ideas and we are saying that do the first thing first pick up the modern ideas if we as leftists or theorists or social movementists we we keep on denouncing the modern ideas you know we keep on laying all the blames of of uh, at the doors of modernity for crimes committed by others like capitalism then how do you confront the non modern hegemony of non modern ideas so we are doing something seriously wrong we have to pick up modernity as our basic plank with all the ifs and buts that you might to add would like to add to modernity or idea of modernity but there is no escape from confronting non modernity with the idea of modernity and this idea of modernity we are not claiming that it is exist in indian society or it has existed always in the indian culture and civilization all we are saying is that we are going to imagine and lay claim to ancient india medieval india today's india cultural and civilizational india from a modernist standpoint so modernity comes as our location modernity comes as our standpoint we the moderns imagine an india you know according to our understanding according to our views according to our research according to our argumentation and that india doesn't have to be modern if a modern person imagines an ancient india of 3000 years ago that india of 3000 years ago doesn't have to be modern no that doesn't happen modernity was not there 3000 years ago nowhere in the world but still we have to imagine what was that india and why do we lay claim to that india that non modern india which has very problematic values on today's ethical normative standards you know still we lay claim to that india why on what basis in what way and why how and why that will be opposite of very different of the way hindutva is imagining that india bhargava your mic is off i think are muted for, for a brief while i lost my connection and i reconnected because of that my chart history got wiped out so i am asking mayur can you please ask the question next question yeah uh, sorry ye do teen sawal actually ek sath aaya tha to main bhi club kar raha hu usme ye hai ki kisi ne pucha tha ki हिंदुस्तान में वैसे भी रैशनैलिटी और रीजन का ट्रेडिशन काफ़ी वीक रहा है तो उस हिसाब से अगर मॉडर्निटी लाना भी है तो हम कैसे ला पाए क्योंकि सामने डिफिकल्टी बहुत ज़्यादा है उसी से रिलेटेड और एक सवाल ये आया था कि ये मॉडर्निटी के सवाल को आप लेफ्ट का जो मास बेस है वो जैसे कम हुआ है इस्पेशली हिंदी बेल्ट में एक समय काफ़ी था यूपी बिहार में भी वो भी काफ़ी कम हुआ है क्या उसको मॉडर्निटी के सवाल से आप जोड़ के देखना चाहोगे लगभग दोनों का आंसर नेगेटिव में है फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल द फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन दैट आई एम स्पीकिंग इन इंग्लिश फॉर द बेनिफिट ऑफ the first question that if the tradition of equality and rationality namely the tradition of modernity has been weak in india how do we you know propose to bring modernity to india that is not the problem we are discussing today bring more modernity to india is not the problem you know exactly the problem we are discussing today 
to whatever extent modernity has come to India. No, it has come to India in the form of a modern republic, modern constitution, many, many modern ideas. You know, it has come in the form, form of us. After all, we are from this soil and we are thoroughly modern. And I, we are no exception. There are millions and millions of Indians who are thoroughly modern, who, who will never go into the bag of RSS, who will never go into the bag of bigotry, you know, and communalism. So modernity has a root to the, to the extent modernity has come to India, to that extent, standing on that modernist position, we are looking back at past and we are trying to construct an idea of India that can be turned into a political force. If that idea of India, imagined from a modernist position, can be turned into a modernist uh, a political force, then that will become a powerful vehicle of bringing in more modernity to India. Because that will be a political force that will defeat these, you know, um, fundamentalist religious forces of all kinds. And then uh, the, the, the modernist foundation, political or social or ideological, stronger. So we recognize that traditionally speaking, um, India may not have a rich tradition, you know, of a struggle on the plank of equality, being a caste society, you know, or rationality, being a religious society, but this was the case all over the world. More or less, it was the case all over the world. Some people solve this problem first, some people are going to solve it later. We Modernity is always going to be born and progress and grow up and grow stronger in non-modern societies. That is the problem you are given with. So, so, so that is, you know, uh, the future of modernity in a non-modern society like India, we are we, we we are discussing today that if we claim Indian history, Indian past, and make that a political force along with other political strategies, that will become an important weapon in advancing the progress of modernity in India. Okay, so, Ravi. The second question was, remind Mayur, second part. Um, Yeah, uh, he was asking about the decline of left uh, oh. in northern India. Decline of left is, you know, you see, there are many, many reasons for decline of left, you know. And um, in a day-to-day -day struggle, the kind of base left had in Hindi belt, despite the backwardness of Hindi belt, despite the fact that Hindi social mind is largely constructed by Tulsi Das, you know, and religiosity, and caste, you know, despite that, left had a relatively reasonably strong base, not very strong, but really, you know, especially in Eastern UP and Bihar and so on, you know. Um, that question does not deal exactly with question of modernity. Modernity question we are dealing in a long historical space. The base was because in from the time of national struggle, there were struggles in Bihar, in UP, in these belts, especially there were peasant struggles, you know, which were led by communists, you know, and they, through those class struggles, roped that part of, that's, that, uh, that part of the society also into the national struggle, you know. And after independence, in Nehru's period, then they took the, the, the oppositionist stance and they always presented the the issues of the people to the government, you know, and raise the issues, you know, let their struggles. So it was it was the actual day-to-day -day struggle that a leftist does, you know, that is what was the basis of that party. And as I said in my answer or in, in my presentation also, that that period when the political hegemony of modernity was there, it was good for leftists too. So it was the left, which has some base in a very problematic area like Hindi belt, you know, was helped by the hegemony of the liberal bourgeois, you know. When the hegemony of the, 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 the semi-fascist Hindutva 
bigots you know fundamentalists that came you know the 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 left had had a more difficult time because the society which was supporting the leftists on the class basis on the basis that these leftist leaders were fighting for them that society was taken away under the from under the feet of the leftists you know by another mechanism and that mechanism was not class struggle because somebody they were not the base mass base was not taken away 